Well, hi, my name is Chantel, and um, I actually have my degree in elementary education, and so learning styles and classroom management, things like that, is something that I thrive off of training on. And um, but I've also been a part and been a children's pastor. Right now, I'm currently home with my two boys, but um, I've been a children's pastor of a medium-sized church and of a church plant. And so have lots of different experiences. But this is my family, my husband, Brad, my son, two sons, David and Noah. And we have surprise baby number three coming in, in May. So busy, busy mom. But um, that's a little bit about me. But this um, is going to be about how to engage kids through learning styles. So we're going to talk a little bit about what learning styles are. But more so today, I'm going to be modeling some different ways that you can um, apply those different learning styles into what you do so that you can engage more kids. And we're going to talk about why that's important, OK? So um, this is my family. So what is what are learning styles? Anybody want to take a guess? And I'm, I love interactions, so feel free to talk, because I love that. So what are learning styles? Oh, she's cheating. She's looking at the sheet already. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> learning styles are a way someone perceives and processes information. So perceive how they take it in, okay? Whether it's what they're seeing or what they hear, whatever it is. And then process how their mind is taking what they've learned and putting it into, applying it into their experiences and then into their life, okay? You guys already have a cheat sheet. So what's the, the next question is, what are, what are the different types of learning styles before I flip to the next slide. Visual. Visual is definitely one of them. What's the second one? Auditory. You can shout it out. I'm okay with that. And the third one? Kinetic or kinesthetic. Okay. Kinesthetic. So if you actually get this Fusion Book 2, I'm going to put a little blurp in, there, blurp in there for a second. I actually wrote a chapter on learning styles and have an actual practical example in there that shows you what each what the kids look like that have the different kinds of learning styles. So there's more in depth than this than what I'm going to go as far as right now teaching. Um, like I said, this is going to be more about things that you can take home with you and do in your classrooms settings. So visual, these are your learners who learn by seeing. Okay. They learn by imagining, that seeing a picture in their head. If they can't picture something in their head, they're not learning it, okay? That's what a learning style is. So they do well with things like PowerPoints, books, pictures, not necessarily words. Some do well with words, some don't because it's not a picture. But if it's a book that they can read that has a lot of details in it or they can imagine it, then they'll learn it, okay? They also say things like, I can't quite picture that. What's that look like? Okay, picture, look, see. Those are the kind of words they use, okay? Then you have your auditory learners. They learn by hearing. This is, these are your kids that do really well with lectures. How many of you like lectures? I'm not one of them, even though I'm sort of doing one right now, but it's all right, okay? They, they do well by hearing. They also like things like music, obviously, because it's noise, right? It's noise. They are the ones that, I didn't quite hear what you said. Okay, th they use more of the hearing kind of language um, than they do like see or um, imagine, okay? I didn't hear what you said. I didn't, can you say that again? Can you tell me? Rather than can you show me, can you tell me? Is the kind of language they'll use, okay? Kinesthetic. These are your hands-on. I am off the charts kinesthetic. We talk a lot with our hands. So this is where my flailing of arms and my movement comes into play. It's not because I have ADD. It's because I'm kinesthetic and I have to move. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So kinesthetic, they have to be doing something. So they're the kind of kids that you do some kind of project and they're like, just let me get my hands on it. I want to do it. That's how I'm going to engage. I'm going to experience it. I want to experience it. I want to feel it. Okay? They have to feel. And then that, that, that's the kind of language they use. Can I do that? Can I try that? I'm not feeling that today. I'm not feeling like being quiet today. 
like being quiet has to do with feeling, right? It's just not talking, but in their language, I don't feel like being quiet today, okay? That's your kinesthetic learner. So the book also goes into a little bit about things that they struggle with, but we're going to move past that and get into some examples here. But why is it important to engage kids according to their learning, learning styles? Why do you think it's important? It keeps their interest? Sorry. If, if so they learn what you're trying to tell them? They can engage, right? When a child is learning, they're engaging, and using their learning styles will help them engage. I read a, this is also in the book, but I read something about a test that they had done and how they just implemented learning styles into what they were teaching. And within three years, they went from 30 kids to 30% um, of kids engaging in to 80, I think it was 83 or 85, the actual right one is in the book, percent of kids engaging into that. And I was like, if we're willing to do that in schools, we should be willing to do that for Christ. I want to reach more kids for Christ. So that means I want to engage more kids for Christ. So if that means involving learning styles into it, you better believe I'm going to do that. So we want to reach more kids for Christ. We want to engage kids. We want them to feel something. That doesn't mean you have to engage them 100% of the time. Just get them engaged at some point in what you're doing. So we're going to take the next few minutes, and I'm going to um, model a couple different ways. One of them I was going to model, but it's going to take way too long, so I'll explain it. But two I'm going to model for you. So the first one is the story about the woman who went to the well, and Jesus is sitting at the well, and he, and he's like, Give me some water, right? Give me some water. Now, as trying to engage those learning styles, the visual, kinesthetic, and the auditory, I'm going to do it in a different way. And I want to see if you guys can figure out. I'm not going to tell the whole story because we don't have time for that. But just give you a brief picture of what that would look like and a way you could do that in your classroom. Okay? Um, but I want you to try to figure out how am I reaching visual learners? How am I reaching kinesthetic learners? How am I reaching auditory learners? So... If I was doing this in an elementary class, <clears throat> I'd actually have the full get out, you know, the whole outfit, and I'd be coming in as that Samaritan woman going to the well. And I would be going in, so we're going to start. Ready? Water, water. Anybody want some water? Anybody thirsty? Anybody want a drink? You got a cup. I can't do much with this mic. <coughs> Anybody want some water in your cup? Water, water. Here, have some water. Anybody else thirsty? Can I give anybody else some more water? Any water? Oh, anybody else likes, I promise, I didn't drink out of it. It's clean water. Water. Okay, and I would be giving the kids, do you want some water? I thought you grabbed your cup earlier. I'd be giving the kids water while I'm talking. And then I'd, oh, you will not believe, you will not believe the story I have to tell you. This one day, I went to the well, and there was a man standing there. And, oh, you know, this is a big deal because you already lost yours. Well, here... Oh, good. Here's some more water. I don't, okay, good. I have more space. I can keep going. All right? So as I'm giving this water, I'm talking about how I met Jesus at the well and how this is such a big deal because Jesus didn't talk. The Jews don't, they don't talk to Samaritans. They don't even talk, and women on top. I'm a woman and a Jewish man is trying to talk to me. Oh my gosh. I can't believe it. Oh, it was so incredible. And he started talking to me, and I was like, who are you? And he's trying to tell me who he is, and he was telling me about my past. And in that moment, I knew, I knew that he was the Messiah. I knew that he was the Messiah. So real quick, I went home, and I shouted to the world about who Jesus is, okay? We're going to do it a little differently today, though. What I want to do today is I want to play telephone and see how fast we can get the news around to tell them about Jesus. So... How this works is I'm going to whisper in someone's ear, and they're going to pass it on to the next person, the next person, the next person, until everybody's got it. All right? You ready? Jesus is the Messiah. Whisper it to her. Okay, and for sake of time, sorry, all of you in the back will not get to play telephone. But that's a very short version of that story and how you can engage the different learners. So who can tell me, how did I engage a visual learner? This is really hot. I'm going to take it off now. My attire. I'm dressed as the girl. Now, give you a heads up. 
if you are doing this, take off any jewelry you have, any glasses you have, because the kids will be like, oh, it's you, I see your ring. It's amazing what they notice. But yes, the way I look, okay? The way I look is definitely for visual learners. How about kinesthetic learners? Drinking the water, movement, okay? They have something that they can feel, something they can touch, okay? How about your auditory? You're talking, the dialogue, right? You're talking to them, you're having this conversation. Yes. Yes, the telephone game would definitely be auditory and kinesthetic, right? They're all doing, they're talking, but they're in motion at the same time. So that's one example of a way you can take a story and make it something so much more. And it, obviously, if you, you're a guy, you probably wouldn't want to do that story that way. But there are a lot more stories about guys in the Bible. So that would be one of them. Now we're going to do an object lesson. Okay? This is why you have a piece of paper. Anybody not get a white piece of paper? Can I have someone run these back there to anybody that didn't? Thank you, dear. This one is going to probably frustrate you visual learners in some ways. The kinesthetic learners are going to love it. And auditory learners, they might get frustrated too. I'm not sure. Kinesthetic will pretty much love it, though. Now, with visual, kinesthetic, and auditory, you don't have to be one or the other. There's often a mix, but everyone has a dominant one, okay? So just being aware of that. Oh, sorry. Did anybody else need one? I'm going to try to do this with the mic. Hey. I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, apparently it's attached to something. This is a fancy one. There we go. Now I can use both my hands. All right, so you each have a piece of paper. This is a great one for John 14, 6. Um, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? So um, what you would not do this with ele uh, early childhood. I will explain what you would do with early childhood in a moment. This is more elementary because even elementary and even some J high kids would have a hard time with this one. But it's a very cool point. So you'd start off. We, today we're going to make a plane. How many of you know how to make planes? Don't start. You got to wait and follow instructions. I see some of you trying to start already. Don't start. You got to follow me because this is a special plane. It's not made like the ones you're used to making. So you're going to take this corner and you're going to go, instead of going just to the middle, you're going to cross all the way over to the other side. So it looks like this. Once you have that, put it up in the air so I can see that you have it. If you need help, raise your hand and we can come around and help you. You need some help? Hey, so, uh, you'd be surprised. No, only Jesus is perfect. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, then we're gonna take this top corner and we're gonna go across and make it look like a house all the way to the other side. Show me your houses when you got your houses. You guys are doing such an awesome job. Such an awesome job. Got your houses? Then we're gonna take it and we're going to fold it in half. Like you do with a normal plane. Put it up in the air so I know you have it. And then we're going to fold down our wings. Now you're going to have this little extra flap. You're going to just fold it down with one of the sides. But you're going to make the, the wings flat and flush with the end of the plane. So it's straight across. Going to do the same thing to the other side. Like I said, with the extra flap, just fold it over. So now you got your plane, all right? Go ahead and fly your plane around. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Make some noise. Great job, great job with those planes. You guys are having so much fun. It's awesome. All right. Can you take a plane to heaven? 
No, you can't take a plane to heaven. Oh. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take, this is the part that's a little hard. We're going to take the wings, starting from the point, we're going to go about an inch down, and we're going to rip it all the way down, and then we're going to just go out a little bit on the side, so it looks like that. And we're going to do the same thing to the other side. Same thing to the other side. Go all the way down. And at the very end, we're going to go out to the side. So you have this. Don't go any farther than this. Just show me this. Now, once you got this, what does it look like? A rocket ship. Let's make a rocket ship. We're going to count down from 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> Blast off. Can you take a rocket ship to heaven? No. You may be able to take it to the moon, but you can't take it to heaven. Ugh. What, how can we get to heaven? Go ahead and open it up. Oh. It's pretty awesome, right? What do you have here? A cross. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's straight or crooked. It's still a cross, right? A steel cross. Who died? on the cross for us. Yeah, let it all soak in first. Oh, who died on the cross for us? Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for us. And Jesus talks about how he is the way, the truth, and the life. La la la, voila. How did I involve visual learners? They had to watch me. How did I involve kinesthetic learners? They got to do it with their hands. And how did I involve auditory learners? I, I verbally gave them directions, okay? Verbally gave them directions. Pretty neat, huh? You guys are in luck today because there was one I wanted to do, and then they told me I had a little less time than I did, and so I had to cut it. But I'm going to explain it to you guys because it's a really cool one. So this one is about the blind man who Jesus puts um, mud on his face and um, heals him, right? So as you're telling the story, what you do is you actually have the kids blindfolded. Which I'm not going to blindfold. That's where it took way too much time to blindfold all of you and do the next step. It just would have taken too long. But um, you put a blindfold on them so that they're blind. Because let's be honest, kids don't keep their eyes closed. You can tell them to, but they are always got the one eye open or like, right? And so you blindfold them. And you obviously have them sit down so they're safe, right? Have them sit down so they're safe. Then there's two different ways you can do it. You can do an oatmeal mix or you can do a cornstarch and water mix and um, I actually like the cornstarch and water mix how many of you just raise your hand if oh thank you you're awesome <laughs> thank you um, how many of you have ever totally lost track of my thought with that uh, cornstarch and water thank you how many of you ever used cornstarch and water it kind of makes this weird, funky, like, liquid form, but then it gets really hard. So it's a lot like mud because when you have wet mud, it's runny, but when it dries, it gets kind of, like, flaky, right? So cornstarch and water is probably my favorite way to do it. But you can um, do oatmeal, too. It's just a little thicker, so the consistency is a little harder to get. But you would have them sit down as you're telling this story, and you're talking about how this man had to beg because he couldn't do anything. He couldn't work. He, he couldn't see. And in that time, they didn't have jobs for for blind people, right? And so he'd have to beg, and how Jesus came through, and, and um, he was hollering at Jesus to heal him and all this. And then um, when you talk about when Jesus puts mud on his, his eyes, you actually take the cornstarch and you rub it on their forehead, okay? Which some people don't like, some people do, but you rub it on their forehead. And then you talk about how Jesus washed, wa how he washed it off, and that's when you use a, like a baby wipe. You wipe it off, although cornstarch is really messy, just FYI, um, but you wipe it off and you have them take the blindfold off, which is a really cool um, experience because, especially for visual learners, because what do visual learners need to do? They need to see. So to be able to imagine and feel and then be able to actually take the blindfold off and see, it has a bigger impact than you realize, okay? So that's a really cool way to involve all the different learning styles too. So how, did, how would you involve the visual learners in that? I kind of just told you that one, but the blindfold and then taking it off 
it's a bigger has a bigger impact because they depend so much on their eyes, right? So to be blinded and then get to take that off is a really cool experience. How about kinesthetic? Feeling the texture of the cornstarch. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely putting the blindfold, uh, having them do the blindfolds on other people and having them put the cornstarch on other people. Yeah. And then auditory, again. And that's, they're like, they're great at that. They like, they don't have to see anything. They hear everything, right? They don't need the blindfold. They're just like, whatever, right? They hear it, okay? So that's a great, great example of one. So what we're going to do now, those are just a couple of different ways I wanted to model for you guys how to um, put that in. And I'm going to backtrack for a second because I told you if you're preschool what I would do for the plain one and I totally forgot to do that so rewind for a second if you're doing the plain one for the um, preschool you'd actually have them act out the planes so you'd have them fly around oh can we take a plane to heaven and then rocket ship you can have them stand up and blast off right and then cross so again you're getting the visual kinesthetic and auditory but you're putting it at their level where they can actually do something because the paper would be way too hard for those. So now fast forward. Sorry. So now we're going to take some time. You guys have some different items. And if you're willing to and want to stand up and share one of your items, we can talk about what story you would put that in and how we can involve visual, kinesthetic, and auditory learners in a fun, creative way so that they can um, engage in the story or the activity. Okay, doesn't have to be a story. It can be an art project. It can be a game. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. So, but we're going to tie it in. So, is anybody the brave, brave person that will stand up first with the item that you took? Some of you're like, man, I wish I didn't take an item. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead and stand up and show us. She's. Um, I found Sorry, one second. Oh. All right. So I grabbed a sheep, and I guess what I would probably do is before the kids get there, uh, hide the sheep somewhere in the room, and then bring in the parable of the lost sheep and uh, have the kids help me find it and talk about the story and then um, have maybe a prize or let the child who finds the sheep come up and talk about how excited they were or that type of thing. So how did she involve a visual learner? They had to find it. They had to see the, the sheep, right? How'd she in, how would she involve the auditory? That's like the easiest one. Telling stories, okay? One thing with the auditory learners, don't give them printed instructions because they do not do well with reading the instructions. They need to hear the instructions. So explaining the game verbally would be a great way to get those auditory learners as well. Kinesthetic. Moving to find the sheep. Moving to find the sheep. Awesome job. Anybody else? Do I have to? Yeah. I have a quilt. And, you know, do you notice how there's lots of different colors on this quilt and different patterns? Isn't that kind of like all of us? We're all a little bit different, but in the body of Christ, God brings us all together and we make one beautiful quilt. Would you guys like to touch the quilt? You guys can come up and touch the quilt if you'd like to. Touch, 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 touch. Awesome job. So you could go a lot of different ways with that. So it was fun to see what you chose because that is not what I had in mind, but that was awesome. So how did she involve visual learners? How did she involve visual learners? How did she involve visual learners? Wow. She let you look at the quilt. <laughs> you guys are so quiet today. All right. How did she involve auditory learners? She told them the story, and she told them how we're all different, right? And how did she involve kinesthetic learners? They came up and touched the quilt. They came up and touched the quilt. Awesome job. Anybody else? Okay, so um, I'm going to start um, by talking about how David uh, was a friend of God and how uh, he prayed, and he prayed you know, seven times a day, and how he got direction that nobody up to that point had uh, received. He had uh, kind of a vision of a temple. And so I have him close their eyes and uh, envision, what does that temple look like? And then I'd, I'd say, okay, now come up and uh, grab um, a dozen uh, Legos and 
put them together, make the best looking temple that you can. Yeah. Awesome. So how did he involve visual learners? The object, seeing the seeing the Legos, right? How did he obviously auditory again is telling the story. It's a pretty easy one. And then um, kinesthetic learners, how did he involve kinesthetic learners? To build a temple, to build a temple with the Legos. And what kid or adult does not love to play with Legos? My husband was excited to have children just for the sake of Legos. So, anybody else? Yes. I'm, I'm like you, I use my hands oh doing yeah, everything. Right. So this guy's named Bubba. He's a nice guy. But we're not sure about this guy. He's very unique and very, very unusual. She has lions, by the way. I have lions, by the way. Okay. One is unique and one is not. But something special about this lion, the not one, and something special about the unique one, they're both children of God. And uh, I would actually have the kids name name the um, name the unlikely lion. And have you felt that way that you're not good enough like this line would be and I might even use it like her story was maybe lion and the lamb or so, you know something unique so there'd be a lot of stories I could do with it yeah but his name's Bubba <laughs> awesome great another way I was not planning on using lines and that's awesome how did she involve visual she had the objects that they could see right auditory she's telling them kinesthetic how can you involve a kinesthetic with that lesson? Let them pass around the lines and feel the lines. Yep, right? And get to name them, right? So, awesome job. I would, yeah, you guys are picking some good stories. I had like lion's den and actually the blanket and the lions actually went together because you can make a fort with the blankets and you could use the lions for the lions and have the kids go under and rawr, make all the noises. Auditory learners? They like to make noises. Your auditory learners are the kids that always have something to say. Oh, 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 right? That's your auditory learner because they have to say or they have to ask questions, okay? So different ways you can involve them that way. Anybody else? Yeah? So I got the flashlight. And um, obviously the, the uh, it's a flashlight. And obviously, like, the, you know, your first thought is Jesus being the light of the world. But I was trying to think of what else could you do with the flashlight. And um, I think I would try to, or one way you could use it, we would get a f uh, different flashlights, enough for each person in the room, turn off the lights, and tell the story of Gideon. And then when, yeah. when the, you know, they break the jars, the lights come on, everyone turn on their lights and, you know, to, you know do their battle cry and all that kind of stuff in the story of Gideon. And someone else has something that would go along with that story of Gideon. Who has it? <laughs> Did no one take the pot in the... <gasps> there it is. Yep, making the noise. I work with nursery students, so I would just basically give it to them and let them bang it. <laughs> <laughs> that works too. That reaches your kinesthetic learner. Playing the drums, play, playing drums and worship for music. Great. So with the Gideon story, how did he involve visual learners? The lights on and off. Okay, lights on and off. Flashlights. How did he, obviously auditory. Yeah, telling the story. Having them even shout, hey, because, hello, they didn't go to fight war and be like, eh. They screamed it, right? Right? And then uh, kinesthetic. Letting the kids use the flashlights. And pound and scream and dance and whatever they're going to do, right? Not every kid will do that, but the kinesthetic learners definitely will. So, great job. Any other ones? Checking my time real fast, sorry. Have a couple more minutes. Any other brave cells? Um, Hold on one second. This is for the recording, so I am just have to make sure you're close by so they can hear. All right, so I'm going to turn my back to some people. So I have a stuffed whale, so one idea could be to... Um, the, uh, auditorily tell the story of Joan and the whale and then like as part of a response you could have kids in a circle or whatever and have them pass it around to maybe some kind of music like musical chairs and when this stopped someone had to make like a connection to a part of the story that you'd already taught them about um, so that they could make you could hear their understanding of the story or something like that so um, that could be something I guess yeah. yeah great job so auditory she did something that's really important what does she let the kids do auditory 
retell the story. Retell the story. Tell their experience from it, right? Auditory learners. Um, so that's going to, the next step between just telling a story, having the kids retell, having the kids ask questions is really important for auditory learners. Kinesthetic learners, what did she do? She passed the whale around, right? Kinesthetically, she passed the whale around. They could touch it, they could feel it. And then your visual learners, they got to see the props, right? Got to see the props with that. All right, anybody else? We have a couple more minutes and I'm going to do question well I'll do maybe one more and then we'll do questions anybody dying to do theirs are there any others out there I, then we may have gone through them all did we get them all awesome check out that timing you guys are awesome all right so those are just some fun ways to involve different visual kinesthetic auditory learners to engage them in what you're doing like I said it doesn't have to be the story but the activity, the game, the story, as long as something in what you're doing engages each learning style, you're going to be great. Because we all can learn in every way, right? But when we're able to engage in the way that we're dominant is when we really see those lights go off. And it also helps get rid of distractions and behavior problems because kids are engaged and are having fun. So are there any questions you may have for me? I know we didn't talk a lot about specifically what learn what visual learner exactly looks like and all of that but are there any questions or any other comments or ideas anybody wants to share just raise your hand and then i can bring the mic to you i'm just that good i'm just kidding any questions so yes and why who would that reach who do you think a smelling something would reach the kinesthetic and really, it's going to reach everybody because, let's be honest, everybody smells and is like, I will eat that or I will not when, if it smells, right? Yeah, definitely. Especially, like, if you're doing, like, the prodigal son and he's rolling around in mud and dirt and it's smelly and, oh, he smelled. He needed to take a shower. How many of you need to take a shower? Some of the kids will be like, me. <laughs> like, yes, your mom has been trying to get you to take a shower for a week. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, definitely, you can involve smell. Especially in younger, early childhood and nursery age, toddler age, you have to have something visual and kinesthetic for them to do. Because developmentally, they cannot fully understand just by hearing. So preschool and below, visual, visual and kinesthetic. Books, props, don't, please, please, please don't teach a lesson without having them either involved physically in some way or showing something because they will not understand it. Elementary is when you can, you have more of that freedom where you can do lessons and stories that may not have visuals, but it's still a better idea to incorporate that stuff. But if you're early child and below, you have to do that. I've seen too many teachers just talk to preschoolers and it's not not good they do not pick it up yeah I'm sorry can I bring the mic to you just because we're recording it I was just thinking about um, with sensory when you're trying to reach a certain child by like playing music um, as like elementary age so it's pretty loud usually and then there's a lot of kids that struggle with it being too loud so you're trying to reach one but you're losing the other at the same time any suggestions it is and there's going to be a little bit of that um, with especially adding incorporating all the learning styles for instance visual learners do not do well with noise okay visual learners get overstimulated by noise auditory learners can also get overstimulated by unnecessary noise okay um, and then you've got your kinesthetic learners who can't sit still right and they need to be able to move if they can't move they shut off and this is true for me even as an adult I have to be super careful when I go into church services because I will not hear a word the pastor is speaking because uh, auditory and visual is like the traditional everybody teaches that way everybody learns that way kinesthetic learner when I'm sitting in a chair and I'm not allowed to move I get lost I'm just like oh someone's moving over there what, what, oh I wonder what they're doing right very distracted by movement and not being able to move and I'll actually shut off so I have to be very purposeful um, with engaging into that 
But kids don't understand that. They don't pick up on that when they're kids, right? As adults, you know how to change things to make it work for you. As kids, you don't. So, and then you got your um, visual learners who also are very distracted by kinesthetic learners because kinesthetic learners can't sit still and visual learners notice every little movement, right? And with PowerPoints, things like that, sometimes we get these, not that it's bad, but sometimes, just something to think about, we get these worship videos that we show and there's all this crazy stuff going on on stage which is very actually overwhelming for a kinesthetic learner, but also can be overstimulating for a visual learner if there's too much going on because they don't know where to focus their attention. So it's this weird balance, and there's always going to be parts where you're going to miss a student engaging in some point, but as long as you get them engaged at some point in what you're doing, um, they'll connect. So there's not an easy way to go about that. But um, you will find even with kids with special needs that are overstimulated, they may need to step out of a certain time. So um, we used to have this girl at the, one of the churches I was a pastor at who was overstimulated in kids' church because there were too many lights, it was too loud, and she would start to act out. Well, we thought she was acting out just to, you know, be naughty. But we learned that she was acting out because she wanted to leave the room. And her acting out meant that someone would take her out of the room. Okay? Don't let it get to that point. If you know someone gets super overstimulated with noise or whatever, get them headphones. Say, hey, I've noticed that Joey's having a hard time with the noise. Is it possible that you could bring some headphones for him? Okay? If it's too much, if there's too much light change going on, which is also something you have to be aware of if you have kids with seizures. Lights trigger seizures. Right? So being aware of what you have, what you, uh, the kids that you have in your church is so important for that. But, um, but yeah, you kind of just have to be sensitive, but know that sometimes the music's going to be too loud. That's okay, as long as it's not the whole time. I think I'm supposed to let you guys go, but I will be around the rest of the day. So if you have more questions, please feel free to come. And thank you for engaging and helping me with this. So 